Thank you, Chuck and David. One of my favorite songs. If you haven't heard, go home on YouTube this afternoon and listen to Shane and Shane do that song. Very, very beautiful song. Especially you put the, that music to the words that were just read. Well, welcome. Um, I, uh, I got a text from Pastor Rick about five minutes ago. And I told him, I said, I am definitely out of my element. I said, um, I am a teacher, not a preacher. And so I'm here today just to talk to you. I don't, I don't have any uh, degree in hermeneutics or anything like that. But I have something that's been on my heart for a while. And it plays right into our The Presence of God series. So before we start, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit here today, and we thank you for your presence here. Lord, our, des our deep, deep desire as individuals, as a church, is that we will not only feel your presence, but your presence will change us. That it will change who we are as people, it will change who we are as a church that it will change those that we come in contact with too. So Lord, we just thank you for being here today. Uh, may our worship be acceptable in your sight. In thy name, amen. You know, nostalgia is a lot of fun. Um, remembering, um, having a good time sharing stories, the good old days, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm gonna just give you one caveat before we get going, and that is that there's danger in nostalgia. I'm just going to leave it there for right now. But nostalgia is a lot of fun. Some of you remember having hair. Some of you remember when your hair was in the right place. Some of you will understand that. Some of you won't. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is that, you know, we, we lamented losing our hair, and yet there are some people who shave it off on purpose. And Tom, I would be not brave enough to do that because I have a funny feeling that my head is not near as round and perfect as yours. There you go. Some of you ladies uh, wish for that girlish figure that you used to have. Um, is Todd here today? He and I ran into each other the other day and he was exercising and I wasn't. And I said, you know, you really kind of put me to shame because, you know, you're, you're trying to stay in shape. And he said, well, you're a shape. I said, yeah, I am. But it's, I said, round is a shape, but it's not the right shape. Some of us remember having um, a waist. Some of us remember seeing our toes easier, reaching our toes easier. A lot of different things. How many of you remember music from years gone by? Okay, who's the guy on the left? See, some of you remember. Who's the guy in the right? Oh, even some of you younger guys. How many of you couldn't name off your favorite group from high school? Not necessarily that we would always play it in church, but you remember your favorite group in high school. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, now that we have the internet and we see who some of these characters were that I enjoyed in the 70s, now I, want, now I know why my parents and my, the adults in my life were concerned for us. Uh, they were some ragtag guys. Okay, uh, how, about, how about my pointer is dead. There we go. Oh, yeah. Now, the car on the right was kind of the car when I graduated high school. Pontiac Trans Am, I don't know what year edition it was, and it was quite the car. Uh, who knows what the top left car is? Chuck does, right? I did, somebody just pointed at you, Chuck. Yeah, somebody, 55, 56, somewhere right in there. Um, what year? 57, okay, see, so some of you, this brings back memory. Now, um, here's a picture of my car, my first car. It's the one on the right, unfortunately. Um, I couldn't believe when I found this. Um, my first car was a Renault 12L. 
They kind of looked like they were going forward and backward. The front and the back kind of looked the same. <laughs> and um, as I've gotten older, I have come to the full realization of why my parents bought this car for me. <laughs> because downhill with a wind behind it, it couldn't hit 55. Um, anyways, I have a lot of memories and, and a lot of uh, um, nostalgia wrapped up in the car on the right. Now it comes a little closer to today. A lot of us remember the day when a large group of people could get together in our homes. And maybe if they do still do without people pointing fingers or talking about or saying you shouldn't have done that. Um, large Thanksgiving gatherings, large Christmas gatherings, church potlucks, whatever it might be. We remember fondly those days. How many of you actually remember the days when there was real crowd noise in a football game? 80,000 people at Arrowhead Stadium or whatever it might have been. It isn't piped in. How many of us long for those days? of when we can actually come together again. How about this? It's not our church. How many of you long for the day when you're packed into a church worshiping? How many of us long for the day when the rhythm of church life, personal life, comes back together again? Um, and I'm going to suggest something that is going to be initially negative, but we're going to spin out of it. I'm going to suggest to you that this is where nostalgia becomes dangerous. I'm going to suggest to you that it may be that you will never see an actual photo like that again. We don't know. It's possible. Um, and where the danger of nostalgia comes in is when we become fixated on what was to the point where we can't move forward. Most anybody, if you say, well, name a Bible story of someone who couldn't quit looking backward. And you're going to run into Lot's wife. The poor gal doesn't even have a name, just Lot's wife. <laughs> and um, she would warn, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay, stay anywhere in the plain. And then skipping ahead a few verses. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not suggesting today that if you look back fondly at any of the things that we've talked about, that you're going to turn into a pillar of salt. But I'm suggesting that there is danger in nostalgia. The idea for, for this whole presentation came, I think, the middle of last year when across my Facebook feed came a Christ Christianity Today article titled, <coughs> excuse me, something about nostalgia and the danger of nostalgia. I actually don't even remember the title of the, the article. And I want to read you a short excerpt from this article. And it goes like this. It says, our comfortable, settled American life has given way to a season of wilderness. Wilderness spaces unsettle us to our core by confronting us with how contingent our lives are. Now, I know what a contingent of people is, but I looked up, I googled this one. You don't usually use contingent in that setting, at least not in my day-to-day -day conversation. But basically what it says is life is unpredictable. Life is, we're not sure. And um, what's happened now? Tim talked about it in our lesson. After, after this week, unpredictable? Yeah, unpredictable. Um, probably wait until next week. Um, but anyways, it is shaking us, it's unsettling us to our core by what we're experiencing. It goes on, it says, now this is interesting. 
The manna God provides us in such spaces, in the wilderness that we're finding ourselves in, the manna God provides in such spaces does not taste like what we're used to. But it nourishes us in ways that the rich fare of our previous life could not. I'm going to leave that one up a second. I long for potlucks. I long for big groups together again. I long for a lot of different things in my personal life and in my church life. But what this author is suggesting is that God has something that may not taste better, but it's better for us. And if we're longing for the rich fare and not satisfied with the manna, there's danger in that to go on. As our current crises, plural, unfortunately, carry on, we will be sorely tempted to recreate an idealized, selectively remembered past rather than attend to the needs and concerns of the present. But God's people must discipline themselves to focus on the here and now, for that is where the work of the Spirit unfolds, making all things new. It's an amazing article. Go onto their, their website, search nostalgia. It'll come up immediately. It's long. It's kind of hairy in places as far as, you know, deep and intellectual. But what they're really saying is that when I long for what was and fixate on that, I miss what the Holy Spirit has in mind for me personally, and as our church, as our schools, quite frankly, our businesses. If we fixate on what was and wait for that to come back, God has something that is much better for us, and we miss new things that the Spirit of God can give us. And the verse came to mind right away. This comes out of Isaiah 46, 19, I think it is, a little small. But it said, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You shall not know it. Uh, it, it you shall not know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now let's back up just a second and look. We are in Isaiah right now. This is written <laughs> while... Israel is in captivity in Babylon. So we're not talking about them sitting in easy chairs. We're talking about they are living in a very difficult time. They're living in a way, in some ways, like us, unexpected. New foods, new experiences, um, restrictions, you name it, on them. And God is telling them Despite what you're going, you're going through, and there's no indication of it, that I am at work in your life and in your situations. You have to trust me on this one. All you see is wilderness. All you see is desert in front of you. But I have a way forward. He didn't promise in this that he's going to send them home quite yet. That's still a little ways down the road. What he's saying is, I want to do something new right where you are, right in the situation that you find yourself in. The impossible is possible, and your way forward is clear, even though your situation and your circumstances say that can't be true. You know, when I was growing up, I wanted a leisure suit really bad. And those are really bad, but that wasn't the kind I wanted. Um, I think those may actually be the Osmond brothers. I'm not sure. That was probably something else that I've tried to forget. But the phrase old has passed away. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm not advocating the complete rejection of the past. What we have been through as a church, what you have been through as an individual, the experiences, what colors you, what, what 
what makes up what we are as a people here even today. But what I am saying is that God has something new for us. And in order for that to take place, we have to let go of our expectations, our ways, and everything. And that, that's something for me personally. I will tell you that when I learned that some of my family would not be flying in for Thanksgiving, I was not a happy camper. Let's leave right there. Because that upset the way it was supposed to be. Um, it's hard to let go sometimes of the past. But until we do, and until we understand that God has something that may not taste like the food I like. It may not be like Thanksgiving that I wanted to have, but maybe God is at work in something bigger and better than that. He is up to something new. And so I want to talk about three ways that God makes us new this morning, briefly. Three ways that God, in the midst of this chaos that we're living in right now, we don't see a way out, we don't see, we don't, can't tell. I mean, honestly, everybody talks about what's it going to be like after January 20? We don't know. What's it going to be like? What, what about this? What about that? We don't know anything. Except we do know that God has said in, the, in this wilderness and in this, these dry, dry creek beds of our lives, he said, I can do something new in you. And so I want to suggest to you, there are three things. He restores us, he renews us, and he resurrects us. And you think about, you know, new birth. Um, you know, in our family, we have one on the way. Had a, a little nephew born this past week out in Washington. Uh, there's just something about a baby. Baby's coming, Megan, Adam. You know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, there's something exciting about newness of life, newness of, of uh, a baby. And I think that's what God is trying to do in our personal lives. I'll be honest, I think it's what he's trying to do in this church, despite the fact that everything seemed to be against that. So here we go. You know, I love the story of the paralytic man who, who had some friends Paralytic man wasn't going anywhere, but he had some friends who said, you need to see Jesus. And so they packed him up. I don't know exactly how they got him there. And they get to the house where Jesus was. And you know the story. It is packed, flowing out onto the yard, and they realized there was no way that they were going to get him in. But they were there to get him to Jesus. And so, I don't know how, exactly how you did it, but, you know, I had a tree fall on my house several months ago, and um, it caused it a lot of damage, and it, was a, it wasn't a thousand dollar bill to fix it. Um, I can't only imagine what it would like to have somebody claw a hole in, in my roof to let somebody down through. <laughs> but somehow, it all worked out, and in, in Luke 5, and in uh, the 20th verse, after this man has been led and, you know, let down in. It's interesting that he says, uh, Jesus says, man, your sins are forgiven you. And he says that in response to whose faith? The faith of his friends. If you look at the context of it, the faith of the friends that brought him there. And then he says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Here we see restoration physically, and we see restoration spiritually. And we begin to see, when God says he wants to do something new in us, he's saying, I want, I want to completely restore you. I want to make you over again. And, and we as Christians in this walk of life need to be willing to carry people who need that kind of restoration. Tear some holes through some roofs clear some paths, and allow restoration to happen in the lives of those who we love. 
I don't know what that looks like. I hope it doesn't include a hole in Tim's roof one night. I doubt it will. He's saying no, it won't, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a faith that restores. It is a faith that pulls people out of problems. And it is a faith that will get us out of the situation we find ourselves in right now. Okay, number two. He restores us. Number two, he renames. Um, when Bert and I were expecting Jamie, you know, nowadays you Google top 20 names for 2020 and they'll give you all the hot new names. Well, when Jamie was born, the internet didn't really exist. There was no such thing as Google. So you had to go down to the bookstore, and they had them back then, and you buy a, a book of names. And um, both Bert and I still say, had we had boys, they would be boy one and boy two. We could never agree on names. But my mom, of course, being the grandma to be, she was very, very, very anxious to know what names we had picked. So I'm thumbing through the book one day, and uh, some of you will know who Frank Zappa is. I think he named most of his children on something other than tap water. Um, Moon Unit was his daughter, and Dweezil was his son. So my mom called one day, and she was all excited. She just, she just <laughs> chomped at the bit to know what we had named, what, what the names were going to be. So we gave her the girl's name, and she said, well, what if, what if it's a boy? And I said, well, and just dead straight over the phone, it said, we picked Dweezil McGee. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of you know my mom, ever the diplomat. She said, oh, <laughs> long pause. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she is frequently reminded of that story. Um, but there's something about your name that matters. We're given a name when we're born. Um, sometimes we're given a nickname in school. It hurts when someone makes fun of our name. It hurts when somebody um, mocks our name. But it's interesting that we have a God in heaven who says in Isaiah 62, the Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings our glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. Stacy, you may be Stacy today, but there's a day coming when God's going to give you a name that's just for Stacy, for everybody else in this room. It's going to be child of God. It's going to be chosen, ambassador, special, whatever it is. God wants to do something new in your life. And that will come with a new name, a new identity, something that says Chuck and David may play violin and guitar, but they are special to me. They are mine. And there's an identity that comes only with the footprint of God. So he wants to restore us and he wants to give us a new name. And the third thing that God wants to do to help recreate us and push us forward so we don't get stuck looking in the rearview mirror. The third thing is he resurrects. And read this text in Philippians 3.10. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Obviously, we know what the power of Christ's resurrection eternally means for us. It means that I have a secure place in heaven. It means that I can rest securely on the fact that my sins are forgiven. But I think that the resurrection of Christ means something for me today. It gives me power. It gives me assurance. It gives me the knowledge that because of what Christ did on the cross for me, I am valued. And as I move forward in life, he's there for me. And so 
for us personally and really for us as a church family. Here we sit in really strange, strange times. And we could talk about that for an hour. Very strange times where we can't do what we want to do, we watch things disintegrating, and we continue to say to ourselves, but, but, but then sometimes we go, well, but when it all goes back to normal, we'll just wait until it does. And I see a lot of heads doing this. And you know, we, March 14 was the last time, well, th well, that was when we shut down. That was a Saturday. That was the first time that we and a whole lot of other people just didn't even unlock the doors. And I think for many of us, we thought, well, we'll be gone a, a few weeks, a month maybe, because you know, this will all blow over. And so we waited, and then we waited. And we did a few things. And, um, but it's interesting to me that that waiting has turned into seemingly interminable length of time. I believe that God is asking us as people and as, indiv as individuals and a church to look forward. I saw something on Facebook the other day. I know you guys have seen it too. And it said there's a reason why the rearview mirror is smaller than the windshield. Um, because God wants a forward-looking people. He wants a people who says, the past may instruct, the past may be fun to talk about, the past may even inspire us going forward, but we have to be a, a, a people who move forward. And I've talked to enough of you to know that personally, this time of wilderness has changed you for the good. It's been difficult. But I think in this wilderness time that we've been in, God is saying, I want to do something new in you. I want to do something that you don't even understand. You go, I can't see this. I can't see how this is going to happen. But it's interesting, you go back to that quote we read, and it said that it's going to taste different. It's not even going to be what your taste buds are used to. But trust me, it's going to be better for you. And that's a difficult thing to do. And he says, in that new diet, I'm going to turn you into a new person, a new man, a new woman, a new teenager. Maybe he's going to turn your family into something different. Maybe he's going to turn your church, whether it be this church or another church, into something completely different. And we go, well, how in the world can that happen? How can that happen when... We can't this and we can't that. Well, God says, if you go back to that verse, if I can find it really quick on my sheet, he's going to, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We, have, we serve a God who can do anything, who can, who can make amazing things happen in us and through us when there's absolutely no way possible from our perspective. And uh, I'd like to close with another text. You guys have seen all these before. It says, now, this is in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. It says, now that I have already attained, or not, excuse me, not that I have already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. We're going to keep reading. That's, that's verse number 12. Basically, he's saying, press forward. Don't sit still. Sometimes we don't know what to do. I mean, I don't know how many times Stacy and I and others have said, what do we do? What do we do? Do we, do we you know, you're trying to figure out how to navigate this crazy COVID world from a church perspective. And God is saying, just push forward. I'll be there. I'm going to make something new happen that you, you, we can't see sometimes. We feel like the blind leading the blind some days, it seems like. And God is saying, just keep moving forward, foot in front of the other. Claim the prize that Jesus has already won for us. Go on to the next verse. It says, brethren, 
I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And again, I want to be very careful. I don't believe that this text is running down the past necessarily. I don't think this is running down um, the blessings we've had. I don't think it's even running down um, us personally. But what it is, it is a call to look forward, to press on, to keep moving. It's saying that you grow and God can use us when we keep pushing forward. When we say, Lord, we don't understand it and we don't know where to go next, but please, we got to put another foot in front of ourselves. Where do we go? What do we do? And the last part here says, I press toward the goal for the prize and the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So I guess my call for us as a church family today is now is not the time to wait for the past to reoccur. Simply because it is the past. Simply because God, I think, is a God of movement. God is a God who wants us to grow. He has already said, I'm going to restore you, I'm going to give you a new name, and I'm going to give you the resurrection power to make rivers in, in the wilderness and roads, or whatever that is, you get the drift. Um, he said, I can make all things possible um, if you will just push forward. And so my call, I guess, for us is to trust God to make us personally and to make us as a church family a new creation. Not, not to say that we take nothing forward from our past, but not to be... Um, not to be stagnated, not to be um, paralyzed, waiting for God to take us back. I fully believe that God is a forward-moving God, and he is a God that wants us to grow and to mature. And so my call for us today, my call for me personally, um, you know, this has been a, a, a tough time. You know, I've watched people die that I like, that I were, were dear friends. Um... I've watched businesses close. Um, and there are times when you say, maybe it would just be as easy to lock the doors again and stay home in my pajamas until noon on Sabbath morning. Um, you know, just being brutally honest. There are times when you go, oh, you know, maybe we just put our head back in the turtle shell. And uh, but God is saying, no, I have something more powerful in mind for us as individuals. I have something more powerful in mind for the Springtown Church or your, your home church if you're not here. It's not your church family. And so my prayer for us is that we would be a forward-looking people that accept the call to boldly move when it isn't possible because it is possible with God and that we would... Um, not be the word I want to say. I've thought about this for a long time, and it's hard to, it's hard to put into words because I do not... Um, I want us to understand that our past instructs, but our future is what pulls us forward. And so my prayer for each one of us is that we would allow God to do something new in us today, that we would... Um, you know, my, my Renault, my Renault is, is a really kind of a bad memory, but my Renault is a memory. And, but I don't think of that when I go buy a car. I don't go, you know, I'd really like another one like that. Uh, they don't make them like that. But, um, and so I think that we need to say to God, what is it that you want next? What do you want next for my life? What do you want next for my Sabbath school class? What do you want next for uh, my youth group? What is it that you want to do through us at a time when it seems as if there's nothing we can do? Because what God is saying is all things are possible and I can do something new. And Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
please accept my stumbling words. May each one of us leave this place ready to be made into something new, to be restored, to accept a new name from you that only you can give us, and to claim the resurrection power that not only gives us assurance for the future, but allows us to move boldly forward with your presence in our lives. May we be a people, may we be a church that fondly remembers our past, but is driven forward by the presence of your spirit in our lives. In thy name, amen. God bless.